Uh, Dr. Wolford, um, I'm going to ask you to look next at CBLA five zeros six zero underscore zero six seven. Um, this is a document I think you saw yesterday yes. evening. Um, it's a letter to Professor Bloom from Alpha Therapeutic, March 1983. And if we go over the page, it's a press release saying Alpha Therapeutic acts to protect haemophiliacs from AIDS epidemic. Um, it, uh, and then it uh, talks in the end of the first paragraph about Alpha having taken steps to exclude from its donor pool persons who may be at high risk of transmitting the disease to others. And if we go down towards the bottom of the page, we can see the penultimate paragraph says, the evidence suggests, although it does not absolutely prove, that a virus or other disease agent was transmitted to them, it's referring to, to um, uh, established cases, uh, in the factor eight concentrate derived from pooled human plasma, which they rely on for life and for sustaining a relatively normal lifestyle. And then it goes on to talk about some of the steps that were being taken. And I'm not, in fact, going to ask you about the content of it. It's really a question of process. Would you have seen a document like this at the time? No. Um, in medicines division, and I know you, you obviously were no longer in the medicines division in 1983, but from your experience there previously, would this kind of material, press releases with important announcements, normally come across the desk of the medicines division? I should think so. I can't be certain, but I would have thought so. It's appropriate. Um, we, we can take that down, thank you. Now, I want to move now to ask you... A, um, did, just some did, did Dr Bloom ever mention to you that he, he had received a press release from Alpha which said it thought that AIDS was highly likely to be caused by a virus? Uh, no recollection of hearing that from him. Um, so I'm going to ask you next a series of questions about the Council of Europe recommendations. Right. Uh, again, if we can just set the scene with um, some of the contemporaneous documents. DHSC 00007161. This is a letter from Dr Gunson to you, the 16th of May 1983. And he says, as promised, I'm writing to let you know what's happened regarding AIDS at the Council of Europe meeting. Um, I don't need that paragraph, thanks, Jim. If we go further down, um, thank you. He says there, there is going to be a resolution put to the ministers of the Council of Europe. While this has not yet been finalised, I can give you the gist. And, and he then sets that out. And then below numbers one to five, he says this, you can see that what they're leading to is the greater use of cryoprecipitate. We saw two years ago that this tends to be the standard product in many European countries. Although I put forward the UK view of this product, the consensus was against us, like you. I do not think BPL could change to freeze-dried cryo rapidly, and the logistic problems would be considerable. Um, uh, um, so that, that's Dr Gunson alerting you in the middle of May to th th these recommendations. Yes. Um, now, if we then look at... WITN 4461129, please. We can see that on the 1st of June of 1985, um, a, a number of people within the department, including you, your name's been handwritten on at the, the top in addition to the other recipients, uh, were... Um, uh, sent the uh, the draft recommendation to the Council of Europe's um, uh, oh, sorry the, the draft recommendation that was going to be submitted to the Council of Europe's Health Committee, and then the second paragraph says Foreign and Commonwealth Office have asked for briefing on the text indicating its acceptability to the UK, and any amendments we propose together with supporting arguments. Dr. Gunson, our representative on the expert committee, has already accepted the main principles of the draft recommendation. So you and others were being asked to comment. Yes. And then if we can see your, your comments, they are at DHSC 0001659. Just one question. Uh, you say that's the 1st of June. Um, can we look at the date at the bottom? It may be the 7th. It may be the 7th, you're and right. Particularly when it talks about next Monday or Monday morning um, in the text, uh, I suggest it probably is the 7th. 
Yes, I think that m that probably does fit with what we know about timing. We can we can double check that. Thank you. Uh, and then um, if we go to DHSC 00016591. This is your response, Dr. Walford, of the 13th of June, 1983. Uh, you say you've asked for comments. Our main difficulty is with the first paragraph of recommendation one. <coughs> Excuse me. Whilst we would agree that it's theoretically desirable to avoid the use of large pool coagulation products wherever it is medically appropriate to do so, this is only feasible if a satisfactory alternative product is available. You then set out a breakdown of the material used for treatment and we see the proportions there set out. And then you say, from these figures, it can be seen that there's no option but to treat the majority of our haemophiliacs with large pool products. And thus, it could be argued that the use of such products is specifically indicated for medical reasons, since the risks of non-treatment are greater than the risks of treatment. However, this is a rather dubious let out. And I think we should prefer to see the recommendation reworded. And then you give your suggested rewording, which is to avoid wherever possible or wherever practicable, you give that as an alternative, I think, the use of coagulation factor products prepared from large plasma pools. Um, this is especially important for those countries where self-sufficiency in the production of such products has not been achieved. Um, so uh, it, I think it's probably going to be slightly easier for people to then follow if we look at what the text was of the draft and then we yes. can see how it, how it changed. Yes. Um, so that... If we look at DHSC 0105313, and if we um, look at the date, so um, th this, this I think makes sense of it being the 7th rather than the 1st, sir. Um, we've got 3rd of June 1983 there towards the top. Um, we can see that your a list of handwritten recipients, copies too, and then the, the fifth name down is, is Dr. Wolford. And then someone's handwritten on, do you have any comments that you would like me to pass on to the UK delegation in Strasbourg, please? Um, and then um, uh, bottom of the page says the text is as follows. Top of the next page, draft recommendation. I'm not going to ask you to reread in all the preliminaries on that page. If we go to the third page... Um, if we look at one and the first insert, so one says to take all necessary steps and measures in respect to AIDS in particular, and then this was the draft that you were commenting mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. to avoid the use of coagulation factor products prepared from large plasma pools, except when such a product is specifically indicated for medical reasons. Now, um, as I understand the minute that we've just looked at, you were recommending the insertion of the phrase either wherever possible or wherever practical. Yes. And, and to put that and then take out the words except when such a product is specifically indicated for medical mm. reasons. Well, that was almost tautologous, wasn't it? Because basically you avoided it wherever possible or practical, but if you had to use it, it would be for medical reasons. No other reason yes. for using it. And, 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 I, and I understand the logic in relation to that last bit. And the, 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 the perhaps the, the more significant amendment is the suggested insertion of the wherever possible or wherever practical. But, so, but there's an exception made. I mean, it seems to me it's saying, broadly speaking, the same thing, although what I think it's saying there is not terribly sensible because why on earth would you give anybody a large pool product or indeed almost any product unless it was indicated for medical reasons? So in a sense... Um, so obviously avoid, except whether it's specifically indicated. Well, I think my, I suggest that my um, suggested amendment, which was, well, look, try your best to avoid large pool products, but it may not absolutely be possible always to avoid. And I don't, and of course, it would, they would only be taken for medical reasons. So uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the, um, the significance that, that you appear to be putting on the change that I was suggesting. So the, the suggested significance, if, if, we, if, if we leave aside completely the phrase except when such a product is specifically indicated. Okay, so, for, so forget that. That did come out, but let's leave that aside. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, um, you, you suggested the insertion, and, and as we see when we look at the final text, this was adopted. But, Which but I didn't know, know incidentally. <laughs> I didn't know. I had you suggested the insertion influence. of the phrase, wherever possible. Mm. And the reason you were suggesting that, as I understand your, your, your minute, was not because of um, concerns about, about product being used when there wasn't a medical indication to do so. As you said, mm. in a sense, it's obvious that it should only be used in those circumstances. It was because the UK would find it difficult to comply otherwise because you, you were reliant upon large pool concentrates. I, I, are, are you suggesting that that's what I was thinking? Yes. I don't think that that's the case. I, well, I don't know that that would have been the, what I was thinking. I was thinking that we, we would avoid if we could, but obviously you couldn't avoid in our circumstance. Uh, and it seemed to, to me uh, we were being asked, how does this fit with the UK situation? The UK situation was that 80% of the product we were using was large pool. It was, it, from the UK's point of view, totally accept that the avoidance of large pool, a very good idea, but you do that wherever practicable. So, and because, in fact, the... the um, Except when such a product is specifically indicated for medical reasons, I don't think you can dis dissociate the two phrases because clearly we, we were using, the country was using large pool products specifically indicated for medical reasons. Obviously, that wouldn't necessarily have been the case for a mild haemophiliac. Clearly, we know that that, that was not the appropriate way of treating um, patients with uh, mild haemophilia. But the generality of the um, use of, of the concentrates was obviously for patients with severe bleeding disorders. And I, I don't really see... I think it's, it's a kind of a semantic proposition that, that you're possibly putting more emphasis on than I necessarily intended. I, I said something in my, in my previous minute about something being a dubious let out and yes. I just, it might be better to look at that Absolutely. because I can't remember what it was yes, of I... course DHSC 0001659 again um, so, uh, uh, I'm oh just, I know now so mm -hmm. my, my reading of this Dr Walford and if, and if you say it's, it's wrong then, then please say mm. so but my reading of this was you were saying um You've, you've given the figures as to what material is, was, as a matter of fact, used mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that, you said, from these figures, it can be seen that there's no option but to treat the majority with large pool products mm. because that's what you had. Yes. It's the supply issue again. Yeah. Then, you, then you refer to that wording of the exception and you say, well, it could be argued that the use of such products mm -hmm. is specifically indicated for medical reasons. And that's what you describe as a dubious let-out. Mm -hmm. And you suggest then the insertion of either wherever mm -hmm. possible or wherever practicable. And mm -hmm. that's why I'd, I'd, I'd read this as you, you suggesting that because the supply situation meant that the UK had no choice but to treat with large pool concentrate. My understanding was that the UK was, the UK was being asked comment on this, how, how would this recommendation affect your situation, as they were asking other countries, of course, not just the UK. We were asked to comment from the point of view of, of the situation in the UK. One could have said, well, let's accept that one, because you've got this exception. If it's indicated for medical reasons, you can go on using it. I thought that that was a bit tendentious. That was a dubious let out. So to be more precise, from the UK point of view, and I didn't know that actually this resolution that had been adopted actually at the end of the day, it would be more honest, if I can put it that way, to just say wherever you can avoid, but, but and not to rely on the, the let out that naturally it's being used for medical reasons. So I, I suspect I was trying to uh, use... A, a, I was trying not to rely on what I thought was a, a rather stupid subclause, and to try and say, well, for us, that is the practical situation. 
may, may I may I perhaps uh, suggest that the, the the being semantic yes. the problem might be the word specifically, because obviously the use of products is indicated for medical reasons, but it specifically might suggest that it, it is an exception. Uh, that there has to be an exceptional reason for a particular case, as opposed to a generality where, uh, as far as practicable, as far as possible, uh, you try to avoid the use of the product. Might that have been what was in your well, mind? Well, I, I, I couldn't necessarily say, but as far as I was concerned, we had some 2,000 or so patients with haemophilia, which was severe. I didn't see given the state of the um, supplies that we had, that we had any alternative but to give some 2,000 or so patients and maybe more, I, I don't know the exact numbers, large pool products. And therefore, I mean, whilst you could see that if only exceptionally you had to give one or two patients for medical reasons this material, then the, the, the use of the word specific would be perhaps helpful. But this, this was across the board for the patients who were coming to haemophilia centres, the vast majority of those who attended haemophilia centres attended because they were severe haemophiliacs. Otherwise, they were not going to be um, constantly being reviewed by, by the centres. So there were large numbers of patients who needed to have, have this material. And my thoughts, rightly or wrongly at the time, was this is a really silly form of words that, that were was being proposed, and I thought that I was being helpful in making making it uh, what I thought was a more accurate form of words as to how the UK uh, responded to this particular recommendation. Uh, b before we look at the text of the final recommendation, because there's then a separate issue I want to ask you about arising from that, um, can I just ask you this? Um, what, what was the general approach within the department if, if you're able to, to speak yeah. to that to something like this a Council of Europe recommendation was it something that was seen as important to comply with or or was it seen as something that was aspirational I, I'm talking generally here mm -hmm. rather than necessarily mm -hmm. this this very one or, or, or indeed was it just seen as something to pay lip service to no I would think that would be a, that latter point would be a, a, a misrepresentation of the department if there was a Council of Europe um, series of recommendations on something, and they wouldn't be recommending on something trivial, uh, I would suggest that the department would do its best to take things seriously. But we need to bear in mind that there had been a um, recommendation for self-sufficiency going way back or bit from the WHO uh, to the early 1970s. People, the department tried to comply. It would certainly not seek to do other than comply. But clearly, our country, just as other countries, were ever always given the option to comment. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, a recommendation might well be amended in the light of the comments received from, from countries that have been asked to comment. And then if we look at the final text, it's at MACK 40307. We go to the second page. We can see it there set out that there's there's the heading um, recommendation number R eighty three eight to the committee of ministers to member states etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if we just go down that page, I'm, I'm not going to ask you anything about the detail here, but there's some basic principles set out. And then if we go over the page, we could just, thank you. So we see there the recommendations recommend to the governments of member states, one, to take all necessary steps and measures with respect to AIDS, and in particular, to avoid wherever possible the use of coagulation factor products prepared from large plasma pools. This is especially important for those countries where self-sufficiency and the production of such products has not yet been achieved. So the UK's suggested rewording was, was what was adopted in the final mm -hmm. recommendation, as we'll see. But, but it's the next bit I want to ask you about. Uh -huh. You'll see that the third recommendation is about blood donors, um, providing blood donors with information, yes. and that, that's the leaflet issue, which yes. I'll, I'll briefly ask you yes. about. But the second recommendation is, um, with that preface of taking all necessary steps and measures, and in particular, 
to inform attending physicians and selected recipients such as haemophiliacs of the potential health hazards of haemotherapy and the possibilities of minimising these risks. So it's a recommendation to, to, to tell two different cohorts, clinicians, the treating clinicians and patients, um, uh, and, and to tell them about, as it were, two things, health hazards, potential health hazards, and possibilities of minimising these risks. And, and, and that, that's what I want to ask you about. D did the government take any steps to provide, first of all, the treating clinicians, the attending physicians, with information about hazards or the possibilities of minimising the risks? Well, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I think a key word in there is selected recipients. We are, in, in terms of large pool products, we are only talking about patients with coagulation disorders and specifically uh, haemophilias A and B. Uh, so essentially, the, we, it was well known in the UK that the UK Haemophilia Centre directors who were treating such patients knew all about large pool products and they knew all about, as much as anybody else did, about the, the risks of AIDS from there. So they would be what I would describe as the attending physicians. And the selected recipients, in my view, would be patients with haemophilia who needed to know. I, I don't, don't, don't dissent from, from that, but the, the question is, did the government, or sorry, did the department, to your knowledge, mm -hmm. take any actual steps itself, yeah. and, and, and if we can deal with clinicians first mm -hmm. of all and then mm -hmm. patients separately, any steps itself to inform clinicians about either of these matters, the potential health hazards in relation to AIDS, because that's what we're talking yes. about, we're not talking about broader health hazards, or to inform clinicians about the possibilities of minimising those risks? Well, as I've mentioned before, it was not the role of the department to, um, to, to uh, inform physicians or recipients about a specific risk or hazard. That was left to the uh, relevant um, medical professionals. But Dr. Gunson, who was the, the consultant advisor in blood transfusion to the CMO, wrote to him to say that patients are being informed. I, 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 will, I will look at that with you yeah. in a moment. So why would, why would there have been... I mean, you're going to propose to, yeah, that the there was a reason to... The answer to my... It, Am I, am I right in understanding the answer to my question? Did the department do anything to inform clinicians of these matters? The answer no. is no. That's right. The, the reason is, you, I think, is what you're saying, if I paraphrase, because you expected they would already know it. Well, we expected they would be told by the treating clinicians. Oh, sorry, I'm just talking... I'm, 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 I'm not making myself clear enough. It's my fault, um, Dr. Walford. Leave aside what patients are told for the moment completely. I'm going to oh, deal the, with that. Oh, the consultants. Well, we knew the, the haemophilia centre directors knew very well what was going on. They, they, they were telling us very often, so we knew. Forgive me. How did you know? You, you knew what the... You yourself may well have known what the reference centre directors... Or got a good sense of what the reference centre directors knew because you'd attended that meeting, for example, in, in, in May of 1983... But if we look at what was known by the much larger number of haemophilia um, directors and other clinicians, because yes. there, there were haemophilia clinicians who are, who are not yes. themselves members of the what you've correctly pointed out was a director's organisation, yes. they'd met in September of 1982 at a point in time at which um, AIDS is, is mentioned in passing and, and Dr. Krask is going to look into it. Obviously, there's then the correspondence from Dr. Crass, yes. and, and I accept you're aware of that being sent mm. out. And then they don't meet again as um, uh, a director's organisation until September or, or October of, of 1983. So are you essentially relying upon the letters sent by Crask, Bloom, Ritzer in March and June of 1983? Well, that's, that would have been one source. I find it quite difficult to believe that... Uh, although you, you, uh, you talk about the reference centre directors knowing, Krask was, had put out a report 
uh, himself, and he was doing the surveillance for the UK HCDO, not for the reference centres specifically. So they had a mechanism. The mechanism was the surveillance by Krask and the reports or the uh, reports that he made, um, and also the fact that it's inconceivable to me that that people treating patients with haemophilia would not have been aware by that stage that that AIDS was an issue and was an issue for haemophiliacs, and therefore I would have expected that they would have all been aware, not specifically of this directive for sure, but, but of the um, concern that there was about potential um, transmission of AIDS and also would, when relevant, speak to their patients about it. The, the second limb of the, 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 the category of information which it said the government should, should pass on is about possibilities of minimising risk. Yes. Now, other than the letter of the 24th of June 1983, which the weak recommendations, which I, I, I won't put up on screen again, is there any really other evidence that the department or the youth at the department were aware of which would show that, that, that clinicians, as a, haemophilia clinicians as, as a cohort, had information about of different ways of minimising risks? I think to answer that question, I might have to say, well, in September, when the HCDO met again, if it was in September, um, you need to remind me what was said then. But this is June, I yes. think. Right. So in September, they, there was probably further discussion at that HCDO meeting. I can't believe that there wasn't. Actually. Yeah, it was an October 1983 meeting, okay. and I don't think you were present at that one, ah. as a matter of fact. We have looked at it on a number of occasions. Dr. Chisholm says, let's revert to cryoprecipitate. Oh, I know. Says, yes. No, let's so not. So they're all talking about it. They're definitely all talking about it. Okay. Um, let, let's... Uh, no, just before I turn to the question of information to patients, did, did the department ever take any steps to um, contact relevant professional bodies, medical royal colleges, or anything like that, to see what information was being provided by them? I'm not aware that, it, that we did. Can I then turn to the question of the provision of information to, 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 to patients? And, and I absolutely accept your premise that we're talking about patients with haemophilia for, yes. for, for the purposes of, of, of mm -hmm. what's set out here. Obviously, there's maybe a wider question about the provision of information to patients receiving transfusions. Yes. It, 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 I think it's right to understand from everything that you've said and from all the material we've looked at and, and, and from the discussion in your statement that the department did not itself take any steps either to um, uh, provide information to haemophilia patients or to ascertain itself what haemophilia clinicians were in general telling their patients. I think that's probably right. I don't have... I can't... Uh provide evidence in one direction or the other, I have no knowledge of, um, if, if you are perhaps proposing that maybe a CMO letter should have gone out, if that's the proposition, well, obviously I can talk to why CMO letters didn't tend to go out on this sort of matter. Uh, but, and in fact, the very first CMO letter that did go out about AIDS went out in 1985. Yes. So not, not at round about this time. And that was, in many respects, for, for a different reason and un, under a different CMO. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, and there may be others in the department who could, who could help on this, basically, I don't think we put out specific information either to haemophilia centre directors or to patients. Um, and you've referred, I think, on more than one occasion to what, what Dr. Gunson had said, and so I think, in, in, in fairness, we should look at that, which is at CBLA 0001710. Um, so this is Dr. Gunson's report of the 13th of June to the Central Blood Laboratories Authority, and it's a report on the discussions that have been taking place in the, in the Council of Europe. 
if we go to the second page, he says, three lines down, I think it's important to comment on these recommendations, since although these recommendations can be supported in principle, there are certain problems in their implementation. Then he deals with the first one, and I've canvassed that with you already, Dr. Dr. Walford. And then he says, in relation to the second one, he says this, and I think this is what you had in mind in mm -hmm. your earlier evidence. Physicians and patients, especially haemophiliacs, are being informed of the risks of AIDS. And then he goes on to talk about the, the, leaflet. the leaflet for, for donors. So yes. it, it's a single sentence which mm. asserts physicians and patients, especially haemophiliacs, mm -hmm. are being informed of the risks of AIDS. Yes. How would Dr. Gunson know, he's not a haemophilia clinician, he's not a member of UKHCDO, he, he may well be able to know what regional transfusion directors are doing, how would he know what the practice was amongst haemophilia clinicians in relation to providing information to their patients about the risks of AIDS? And the date of this um, June, June of 1983. The reason I ask for the date is that, of course, he was working together with uh, quite a number of haemophilia um, centre directors and others on the um, plasma supplies. He had a working party, so he was certainly in contact um, directly with some haemophilia centre directors, whether or not. Um, and that, that he reported, I think, in about June 1981, his report came out. So it's roughly of the same order. So he was in contact. It's a great sadness to me, actually, that Dr. Gunson, who was a marvellous man, and uh, I never knew him to say anything that he didn't believe to be true, um, isn't, isn't here because, of course, unfortunately, he died. But basically, he would not have said that if he didn't know. I don't know how he knew, but he would not have said it if he didn't know. Is it d d d the evidence that the inquiry has received overwhelmingly from individuals, and it has to be said largely, I think, co corroborated by those clinicians from whom the inquiry has been able to obtain evidence, would indicate that patients were not given that information. Well, the only thing I can say is that, as I said before, Dr. Gunson will have been of the view and under the, uh, under the uh, firm view that actually uh, patients were being informed, but he might have thought about it in some sort of general way as opposed to was every haemophilia clinician making sure they called up their patients and talked talk to them. That may be a, a, a difference. He was talking about the generality, I would suggest, not the experience that sadly seems to have um, occurred with a number of, of patients that we've heard during the inquiry. Was it the department's, uh, again, I'm, I know I'm using that in a very loose term, and, and, and you're an individual, not, not, not a representative of the entire department, but you, you've said in your statement that um, the, the, the prevailing culture at the time was um, it wasn't the department's job to become in, in involved in what was seen as a matter, again, of, of clinical freedom. It was for the clinician to decide what information to give to yes. his or her patient. I, I, again, I don't know whether you, you can answer this or not. Did, w w was, the, was the assumption that was made by you, your colleagues, um, that clinicians would be telling their patients about risks and possible ways of minimising those risks because that was the right ethical thing to do? Or, or was it something that the, you just didn't think about because it, it, the department's culture was, we don't get involved in this, it's a matter for clinical freedom? From this remove, I have no idea what I was may have or may not be thinking uh, about that. Certainly, uh, I would have known that this was a matter for the field authorities, if I can put it that way, to, to deal with and not the Department of Health. Uh, and it may have been, uh, in, many, in many respects, if there was going to be some sort of um, broadcast information to doctors, this would have been a matter for the chief medical officer who would have, in discussion with his consultant advisor, uh, decided to, to take steps to make sure that patients were being informed. It would not have fallen necessarily to me or to anybody in MedIMCD uh, to make that proposal. 
do you recall if you ever asked Professor Bloom, a con because you, th there'd have come a point in time when you were conscious that of this an, of an issue because of the Council of Europe recommendation. D did you ever, do you think, ask Professor Bloom, um, are, are patients being given this information? Mm -hmm. I didn't have that degree of close contact with Professor Bloom. You've seen pretty well all the um, uh, correspondence that I'm aware of and telephone calls. So I was not in frequent discussion with Professor Bloom at all. Looking back now, do you think it was a failure on the part of the department? And I, and I use that term deliberately now. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about you individually because there were a whole range of civil servants and doctors with mm. differing responsibilities. A failure on the part of the department not to take some steps in accordance with the Council of Europe recommendation to ensure that patients had the requisite information to enable them to make an informed decision about balance of risks? It would only have been a failure if it had been the normal process, the normal procedure for the department to intervene in, in this sort of way. With, After all, there was a, a plethora of conditions. In each case, important um, findings, important developments taking place. The department could not and did not provide relevant information to clinicians about um, clinical matters of that kind. It was simply not set up to do it, and it did not do it. So if you're asking me, was that a failure? We should have done it because that's what we normally did. The answer is it wasn't a failure because we, it's not what we normally did. But the plethora of conditions probably didn't have a specific Council of Europe recommendation which, which, which the department had signed up to, or the government had signed up to, with the department's knowledge, which included a recommendation that the government take all practical steps to inform patients both of the risks and of the possibilities of minimising that risk. But doesn't that set it out from the, what might have been the normal approach of the department. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I appreciate the point you're making, but if that were the case, it would not have been unfallen to me, and I don't know to whom it would have fallen, to actually make sure that this particular Council of Europe um, recommendation was promulgated. I mean, this was <laughs> way above the sort of uh, level that I was operating at. If this is a governmental issue, then, then that matter fell to be uh, considered at the top of the office and, and uh, with the chief medical officer. So, so, so the question of, of meeting that recommendation ultimately would have fallen, you think, on, on the shoulders of the chief medical officer. If, if anyone was going to do it, it would be the chief medical officer. That, but I'm not clear whether or not this went anywhere near ministers, because it seems to me that this it would did. have... It did. Yes. OK, but I didn't know that. No, no. And I'm, so we'll so see what that I'm trying with to say Arthur. is that I didn't know what had happened to it. It was something I was asked to comment on. I commented. We've seen what the outcome of that was. But therein ended my role. And if it did go to ministers, then there was presumably a conversation between ministers and deputy or, or permanent secretaries and the CMO even. And that's where the decisions would have been taken or not. And, and, and let me make it clear, I asked the question of you not because I was seeking to suggest it, it was your personal responsibility to implement the, the Council of Europe recommendation. It was asking for your reflection on a very, as a very experienced um, clinician and civil servant on, on um, uh, what the department should or shouldn't have done. So. Understood. Um, penultimate topic on AIDS, and, and then one further matter I want to ask you about. Um, the line to take of no conclusive proof. Yes. We looked at the, the origins of it in, or what may have been the origins of it in early May 1983, yesterday with the suggested draft for the Prime Minister, which wasn't in the end utilised. Um, so can I then pick up um, um, y your own involvement uh, at DHSC 0002309 underscore 123? Um, so, 
um, we can see here reference to a paper prepared by you giving some information on AIDS um, that's going to be provided to Lord Glenarthur. And then um, the paper itself is at DHSC 302229 underscore 054. Um, we can see there you're providing it to all Med SB professional staff, 28th of June. We, un we think it is the same paper as, as went to, to um, uh, um, Lord Glenarthur, and, and, and I think I did to, to Mr. Patton as well. Um, and if we go a further two pages on. Um, I'm not going to go through the detail um, um, of it, but um, it, I'm showing you this really because the no conclusive proof formulation doesn't appear in this background paper that's being, it would seem, supplied to Lord Ganatha um, in June um, of 2000, um, as of June in 1983. Um, so that, that, that's, as it were, the, the starting point. Um, now, if we then go to DHSC 302229 underscore 085... We can see this is an answer given by Lord Glen Arthur in the House of Lords on the 14th of July 1985. And if we go just a tiny... 83, I'm so sorry. If we go a tiny bit further down the page and we look at the left-hand side, we can see it says the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, Lord Glen Arthur, and then it's this, the second paragraph starts with the Medical Research Council, and then the last sentence of that paragraph, although there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted by blood or blood products, the department is considering the publication of a leaflet. Um, etc. Now, um, I'll be asking Lord Glenarthur more about this tomorrow. But do you do you know at, at this distance of time if you were involved in the the drafting of the, the suggested answer for Lord Glenarthur? No, I wasn't involved in this, as far as I know. But it's subsequently Lord Glenarthur is asked by is it, um, Baroness, Baroness Masham. Masham uh, about cryoprecipitate. And that's when you become involved, as yes. far as you're aware. OK, so then let's go to that. You wrote, you wrote some wording for Lord Glenarthur for a suggested response to Baroness Masham, DHSC 0001109. Um, it's dated 20th of July, 1983. Here with some wording for the reply by Lord Glenarthur to Baroness Masham um, and... and one of the issues was cryoprecipitate. So your first paragraph is about cryoprecipitate. I don't need to ask you about that. And then the second paragraph says, there is no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate, or factor VIII concentrates, but the assumption is that such transmission may be possible. So I, I, I will get to a question eventually, but I just want to go through the documents. You here say you're using the no conclusive proof formula. I'll, I want to come back to you about that. But you have added here a qualifying clause, but the assumption is that such transmission may be possible. That, 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 that's your draft. Yes. Can we then go to DHSC 0002309 underscore 032? Uh, I, I think it's also the, the use there is not that AIDS is transmitted by blood, but AIDS can be. That's the formulation there. Yes. Yes. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a difference, it might be okay. material. But shall, shall we... I'm not... Well, just, I'm uh, not uh, sure uh, that just, I would necessarily... Just an observation, but let me move on. Okay. Um, so if we then go to DHSC 302309 underscore 032, this is a, a minute dated the 26th of July. It's copied to you. And um, if we just go further down the page, we can see date and the fact that it's copied to you. Um, and then it's directed to Mr. Joyce, who I think was in Lord Glen Arthur's private office, um, probably, but we'll so. establish that with him tomorrow. Um, and it says, um, uh, uh, I, um, I understand Ms. Edwards is replying separately, etc., etc. Um, so um, if we go over the page, 
we can see th this is, I think, as, as we understand it, trying as best we can to put the bits and pieces of paper together. Mm -hmm. um, the draft contribution to the reply from emanating from Mr Parker, emanating from HS1, I should emphasise that there is no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate or factor VIII concentrates. So your qualifying clause has been omitted from this draft. Yes. Um, d d do you know why? No, I don't think I was aware that it was. But, uh, I mean, we think you might have been copied into this, but assuming it accompanied the minute on the preceding page. Do you have any memory of whether you spotted that the draft had been amended or attached any significance? I don't know whether I would have actually reread something that I was supposed to have written, no. And then if we go to the final um, letter that's sent to Baroness Masham, WITN 4461147. This is Glen Lord Glen Arthur's letter of the 30th of August 1983. We go to the third paragraph. We can see the final draft is... There is, in fact, no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate, or factor VIII concentrates. Um, so again, uh, um, uh, a, a, a statement there with, with, without the qualification mm. of your original draft. Um, do, 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 you, do you have any concerns about the removal of that qualification mm. so that one has here the fairly strong mm. statement of no mm. conclusive proof? Well, I guess I would always have concerns if I thought a, a piece that I had written had actually been amended and I hadn't been aware that it was going to be amended. So if, if something is attributed to me and I don't, didn't know or hadn't spotted, how shall I say, because if you say I saw it, I might have done, but I suspect I might not have reread something I, I was told I'd already written. But one is always concerned it must be like a journalist writing for the newspaper when when the sub editor takes out a very crucial phrase so it looks like a crucial phrase in my view was taken out I don't know why or how uh, but uh, clearly it would concern me if something's being attributed to me which is not strictly what I wrote if we then move from August to DHSC 0002235 underscore 048. So if we look at um, the article on the top of the page, first of all, US blood caused AIDS. The date we can see has been handwritten on the 1st of November 1983. Um, uh, and this refers to uh, the, the Bristol case, as, as, as we yes. called, called, called this individual. A British haemophiliac who died from AIDS almost <coughs> after of the disease from contaminated supplies of blood clotting agent factor eight imported from the US doctor's report today. Um, and then we see uh, the third paragraph on the left hand side there. It records Dr. Helena Daly, Dr. Jeffrey Scott, the, um, who were the tre treating clinicians at the Bristol Haemophilia Centre saying it seems highly probable that the development of AIDS was related to this treatment. This case provides further evidence for a link between blood products and AIDS. And then if we zoom back out, we'll see there's a cross marked behind that paragraph. And then if we go down to the bottom of the page, someone has written, Dr. Wolford, have you seen on X, mm -hmm. is it okay for me to continue to say there is no conclusive proof that the disease has been transmitted by American blood products. Can, can we just zoom out again? Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, and we've got a date there at the bottom that looks like it might be the 23rd of November. Mm -hmm. uh, so P.S. congratulations on your promotion. Um, and then above that is what I understand to be your handwriting. That's right. Mr. Green, thanks. Yes, it is okay. Yes. So... Um, November 1983, you are endorsing the continuation of this line, no conclusive proof. Why? 
because I was answering Mr. Green's question. Incidentally, I didn't really know who Mr. Green was at that time, and I don't think I ever met him, but he was in HS, I, I find. I was answering the question, does this particular report make any difference in terms of what, what we are saying? That report, um, as I have now found out and, and have found out since Lord Penrose asked me about it, that report in the um, Observer, or was it the Guardian? The Guardian. Guardian I think. That report in the Guardian, the same report had occurred, or the death of this unfortunate patient had been reported a month earlier in October in the Guardian. It was the same case that had been reported in September to the various bodies that it was reported to. And basically, there had been no suggestion by anybody over that period of time that, uh, that, I mean, nothing new had occurred because of this report in the Guardian to which he was drawing my attention in November from September when we knew about this case. So it was not a revelation. Unfortunately, Mr. Green didn't know that. And, and basically, shorthand, perhaps I should have explained in more detail, it would clearly, I dearly wish I had explained in more detail, that actually this report X doesn't change what it is that we have been saying. But my, um, uh, the caveat, or the, rather the rider I would put on that is that pretty well, as far as I know, every time I talked about no conclusive proof, I always added a rider. But it's either looking increasingly likely or it, uh, it appears that that this may be taking place. My, my line, if I can put it that way, since I didn't devise the first line, was always to put a qualification, but it's looking likely or it may well, it may well be the case. This was a, a very shorthand um, bit of question and answer. Somebody scribbling on a, on a, a, a journal, on a photocopy of, of a newspaper, pointing out to me, as it were, what he thought to be a new development, but it wasn't a new development. And therefore, I simply said, yes, you know, nothing has, nothing has changed. So it's not a broader question that you're answering then. The broader question, is this an OK line to, 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 to be answered? No, I was answering, does this change anything? Because there's a big cross. In other words, have you seen on X cross because the patient had it was reported as having died is it okay as I mentioned before the fact of this case the fact that there was a patient who had been suffering from AIDS was the most important fact a UK patient the fact that as we know so many patients who actually did get AIDS actually died was was not was of course of monumental consequence to the family of the individual, but was not uh, made no difference to policy, if you like, because the policy area, if we had been changing anything, should have been when we realised that there was another, a second case of AIDS. So uh, this is a is a truncated bit of exchange with somebody whom I didn't know, who seemed not to be up to speed with what was going on. If we just, just look further up at the article again, the X is not by, I mean, one might be reading far too much into this, but the X is not by the date. The X is by the fact yes. that two um, haemophilia clinicians yeah. are saying it seems highly probable that the development of AIDS was related to this treatment. Now, as a matter of semantics, highly probable and conclusive are not the same thing. Except yes. That. Is, isn't that what you're being asked to reflect on? Well, I don't know about that, but one, I do know that actually these clinicians, or at least Dr. Scott, had not reported this case, which is why CDSC hadn't known about it, because the clinician himself didn't, was not convinced that it was a case of, of AIDS. So he's now saying this to reporters, and he may have said it the week before, or the month before, but I didn't read into that, into this exchange that we did, which is obviously quite a hasty one, um, 
basically that, that there was anything more than we now have another case which looks as if it's related to American factor eight. The fact of the patient's death was not of the essence in relation to the policy. It was, um, it was the fact that there was an, another case. But that other case had been, uh, as it were, factored in to the knowledge in the wider, wider world of, of hemophilia that that case had occurred. And that had been factored in in September and not when The Guardian chose to report it. Picking up on that, should then, in your view, the no conclusive proof line have, have been abandoned at the point at which the second case became apparent as a case of AIDS? I remain of the view, although I didn't compose that line, I remain of the view that we did not have conclusive proof. And you might say, well, what is conclusive proof? And I think I um, referred yesterday to the fact that if you had been able to determine a virus in a particular uh, donation, and you had been able to obtain to uh, find that virus in the um, recipient, you've got to the point where you've got conclusive proof. As you saw from the American um, the discussion in America, as you will see when you if you do look at the MRC discussions, nobody was saying that this was absolutely conclusive. People were, were constantly wondering what was going on. And clearly, I felt, and, I, and you can see from various other correspondents, that I felt increasingly there was, it was likely that, that this was happening. But I had no conclusive proof, and nobody had any conclusive proof. And whilst it, whilst it may sound... Um, it may sound dismissive, if that's what it sounds. It wasn't intended to. It was, we don't know beyond a per adventure. We have no ironclad proof that this is what is happening. That, that, that was, could be said that that's effectively a, a trite fact. Until you can test, you have no conclusive proof. Yes. And indeed, I think the evidence that we'll hear tomorrow or Friday may suggest that this line was abandoned after you've left, but before, um, before there is what, what you would have regarded as conclusive proof in the form of an ability to test. But, but that, I mean, in any event, that, that's after your time. But what, what was the point of this line? Why did the department want to emphasise the absence of conclusive proof, which may be true in a narrow technical sense, rather than the presence of a likely risk? Well, as I um, made it very clear, this wasn't my line. It was the department's line, and the line was qualified in, in most instances and should have been qualified in all instances. Well, can I ask the question in a slightly different way then, um, recognising that you're, you're not, and I wasn't seeking to suggest that you were the originator of the line. We, we don't currently know who was. Um, can you help us in understanding why the department took a line which emphasised the absence of conclusive proof rather than explaining what, what you've told us was your own view and had, was the mainstream view within the department that there was a likely connect cause? No, I can't. I can't particularly, but basically, if the line had been appropriately qualified, I would have no... Um, qualms about it at all. It, the fact that it wasn't appropriately qualified on each occasion obviously uh, is very unfortunate um, because it might sound as if it's much too definite, if you will, even though over, it, it, the words don't say that. The words say no conclusive proof. They don't say uh, uh, no proof at all, no conclusive proof. But if it were qualified with, but it looks likely, uh, and we are taking this, that, and the other step, whatever that might be, I would have said that that's a, a perfectly correct and proper, scientifically correct and proper um, way to, to um, 
put out something publicly. Now, I'm sure you'll be bringing me to look at the leaflet, ultimately, where you will see my almost preferred way of expressing matters in order to leave no ambiguity. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to take the leaflet very quickly because I think your involvement was at the beginning and, and you were then, as it were, copied in but not central to the process. And we're going to be looking at it in some detail with both Lord Glenarthur and Lord Clark. Um, um, but, but, but you, I think, have anticipated um, what I wanted to ask you next. The leaflet poses a question about transmission and answers it with the words, almost certainly yes. Uh, and you've, I think, said in your statement, well, donors needed something that was clear and unambiguous. Yes. Didn't the patients who were going to be exposed to that risk or the public yes. Yes. also deserve something clear and unambiguous, which this was not? The point I was trying to make about the blood transfusion leaflet, and actually um, I went further with Dr. Gunson, went further than the science would lead us, because you've talked about the leaflet that ultimately was sent, but that was not the leaflet that Dr. Gunson and I prepared, because we were so concerned that donors would still continue to turn up, even though they were active homosexuals who'd recently had uh, sex with other men. I didn't expect too many drug um, abusers to turn up, but I thought that there had to be some way of really dissuading donors. It had to be completely stark, black and white, no ambiguity. So when Dr. Gunson and I, and he was of the same mind with me, prepared the first draft of the leaflet, it didn't say almost certainly yes. It said, yes, it can. Now, that was going further than the science really allowed, and you might say, um, correctly, it was correctly reined back because it really was not scientifically correct. I didn't, we didn't know. But the, the, the thought that you were preparing a leaflet for donors, which was in any way wishy-washy or ambiguous, so that they could pick it up and think, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, and, and we, we really wanted to make it abundantly clear, potentially, if you give blood now, you may infect, uh, you, your blood may transmit AIDS. And so it was a, there was a, a sort of almost horses for courses. Uh, and in that case, I think we did go further than the evidence really would let us go. And in a sense, rightly, were, were, were hauled back by whoever whoever drafted the second ver version of the leaflet. Um, but you see where my thoughts lay. In other words, I would have been, um, wanted to have a, a greater degree of qualifying all these messages than actually turned out to be the messages that were actually conveyed by ministers or by the department in general. But it wasn't my call. Can I just then explore, before we leave this topic, two, two, two propositions in relation to the no conclusive proof line for, for, you, to, for your comment or reflection. It had the potential, at least, did it not, to create a false sense of security or, or to mislead. Th those receiving it might get the wrong message, in other words, because they're not being told what was actually the department's view, which was that AIDS is probably caused by, transmitted through blood and blood products. Do, do you have any observations on that? I think appropriately qualified so that it's perfectly obvious that, we, that nobody is disregarding the possibility, no conclusive proof, that is correct. It's correct scientifically. You'd only get conclusive proof at a time when you could actually test and determine what had happened. But the department is doing X and Y, including producing leaflets, including um, uh, doing whatever it was we were doing, uh, if you like. Uh, and I saw various configurations of this in various ministerial statements. I don't think that would necessarily be misleading. The question is, who was, who was actually receiving these messages? 
And these messages were, by and large, promulgated as part of PQs or in Parliament. They were in Parliament, they were press releases, um, they were communications with uh, other members of, of either the House of Commons or the House of Lords, uh, who presumably were raising things because they thought they were matters of wider public interest or of interest to individual constituents. You, and you've just reminded me, thank you, uh, of a, a very pertinent fact. And that is that when the leaflet was actually promulgated, which was the donor leaflet, not for the wider public, it was accompanied by a, a, a press release, which the department put out. Now, the leaflet was agreed to be a UK leaflet, but both the DHSS and SHHD agreed to put out their own press releases. Our press release, you've undoubtedly got. SHHD chose to use the formulation, no conclusive proof. They didn't have to. Nobody was insisting that they did. They had their own CMO, their own scientific uh, advisors, but they chose to use that formulation. They, they absolutely were free to do their own press release, and it differed in other respects. But, but they chose to use that formulation also. The second aspect I wanted to explore with you is, is, is this. It, it might be said that the department chose uh, as this line to take this formulation of no conclusive proof rather than saying in positive terms, we think it's likely, because that excused a failure on the part of the department to take more radical action. Do you have any observations on, on that suggestion? It's a suggestion, Miss Richards, but I can't necessarily say. I've never heard it expressed in that way. And uh, I would have no reason to believe that that's what they were doing it for. Um, can I then take the question of the AIDS leaflet? And I, I'm going to take it, to, um, for present purposes, I think, fairly quickly. Yes, certainly. Um, because uh, um, you've dealt with it in detail in your statement and because we're going to hear a lot about it over the, the, the coming sure. days with other witnesses. So I just want to establish... Um, really, with, without, I think, having to go to too many of the documents or, or necessarily any of the documents, w what it was, um, what your involvement was. Um, you attended a meeting of regional transfusion directors um, at which this issue was raised. Yes. And, and I understand it's a meeting of which you've got, a, in contrast to some others, a distinct recollection. Yes, unfortunately, I um, have. Because there was a degree of adverse or hostile reception. C can you just elaborate upon that? Yes, uh, although we saw the other day that my presence in the Haemophilia Reference Centre Directors meeting was not particularly welcomed. I, I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't made to feel terribly unwelcome. When I invited myself or asked to go to the Regional Transfusion Directors meeting because I wanted to persuade, together with Dr Gunson, to persuade them that there had to be a leaflet for, um, for donors because I already knew that there was reluctance to do that. Uh, I, I do remember, because it was not comfortable, um, that the chair of the meeting at that time said words to this effect, and they might have even been a bit stronger. Since Dr. Walford has wished herself on us, I suppose we had better wait, hear what she has to say. Now, this is not a particularly um, helpful introduction to whatever it is you're going to say. And what I had to say was deeply unwelcome to the transfusion directors because I was there to say we in the department believe that there should be a leaflet for, for donors and it should say in no uncertain terms that um, people who might be at additional risk for AIDS or in what was called the higher risk groups, particularly um, male homosexuals uh, should not uh, donate um, blood and should be excluded from donation. And as I anticipated, uh, that went down very badly. It is fortunate that Dr. Gunson had actually written into um, the meeting beforehand to make some suggestions about um, the potential um, of what material should go in the leaflet. And it may be that you're going to show us um, anything from that meeting. But basically, he offered four options, I think. And two of them were turned down out of hand. And then the, another two, I don't recall what they were precisely. 
but with great reluctance, they agreed to a leaflet. And they said they would um, prepare one uh, and that it would then come to the department. And I think I probably stressed that it needed to come quite fast and the department would pay for the printing if that was helpful. And when I did eventually get the leaflet, the draft that they produced, uh, it was some time. I remember feeling very impatient and why hadn't it turned up? It was really not, not adequate for the purpose. It, it, it was what I, as it were, was talking about earlier. It was ambiguous. You, you really weren't sure what they were trying to say to donors. Um, and so I spoke to Harold Gunson and said, this, just, this is just not strong enough. Uh, and he absolutely agreed. And he agreed that he, and I think probably with his colleague from Edgeware Blood Transfusion, I, I, I get that impression from papers I've sent, subsequently seen, I don't know if I knew then, um, redrafted. And then what you had then was the redraft that uh, had been um, redone by Harold Gunson. And you, it was sent, I think, uh, circulated around the department. You sent it to Mr. Wynne Stanley. Yes. Um, um, and then it, I, it would appear that the department's own information division got involved. And there's yes. two and throwing about wording, which I'm not yes. going to ask you about. But if we just go to a, a memo from Mr. Wynne Stanley... Um, there's just one point I wanted to ask you about. It's DHSC 0002321 underscore 018. Um, so it's Mr. Winstanley. It's dated the 8th of June, 1983. Um, it, it's to a Mr. Windsor in the ID information department. Um, he says in paragraph two, there are some things that are either incorrect or misleading because the information department have made various revisions. Mm -hmm. Not going through, going to ask you to go through those. Um, now we've got the document. If we go over the page, um, if we look at the last paragraph, paragraph five, um, he then says, to sum up then, I think we can accept your text subject to the comments above, but it is essential to act without delay as it is, the time for printing and distribution seems per painfully slow. And, and then there's an issue about printing and, and, and payment. So it would appear Mr. Winston is already concerned it's taking too long. Yes, it was. Um, because, of course, it, as every day or week went by, mm -hmm. a donor, a high-risk donor, might be giving blood, infecting the donor pool, for, for, if the blood's used for blood products, or a transfusion might be given to a recipient of, 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 of transfusion and, and be infected with AIDS. Yes. Um, now, I, I, I'm not going to go through the detail of what then happened because I can do that with Lord Glen Arthur yes. tomorrow. Um, but we will see when we look at the evidence tomorrow, there's then a paper and a revised leaflet that went to Lord Glen Arthur. And, 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 and um, uh, finally, after some toing and froing, which I won't trouble you with, it's September by the time the leaflet is... Um, I think it's uh, the beginning of September, but it's nonetheless September by the time the leaflet is yeah. ready. It's a press release by Mr. Clark and so on. That was too long, wasn't it? Much too long. Um, and then, can you just assist with, with this? I, I, I want to ask the same question of Lord Glenarth and Mr. Clark, but it, it's an issue in which ministers got quite quite involved in the nitty-gritty. Yes. Um, and yet, by contrast, we've seen other issues yes. such as the Galbraith mm. paper, the decision of the Biological Subcommittee mm -hmm. on the Committee of the Safety of Medicines, seemingly not going to ministers, or at least not going to Lord Gnatha, subject to anything he tells us tomorrow. Yes. Uh, what's the rhyme or reason as to what goes to a minister and what they get interested in and what doesn't? I wish I knew, actually. Uh, occasionally it did seem... I, I didn't spot the particular logic we discussed the other day. Why on earth did the question of the steering group of the... Of the, of the CBLA or whatever it was. Why on earth did that have to go to ministers? Um, I don't think I ever really fully understood, which goes to the fact that I probably never had the sort of administrative training that my administrative colleagues had, and I just accepted that some things that they thought had to go as, as uh, um, you know, submissions to ministers, then, then they had to go. So I'm not sure that I ever really understood the in, inwardness of it. This was a very interesting one, though, because of the degree of intimate involvement that a whole variety of ministers seemed to take. And 
I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, clearly there was worry about the blood transfusion service and that it might be impacted adversely and that therefore there would be a reduction in, in the number of donors wanting to give blood. And that was not an unreasonable thing to be worried about. And then there seems to have been a big sensitivity, and I'm, I'm only maybe interpreting stuff, but this is frequently asked me to interpret, and so I'm doing it this time. Uh, huge sensitivity over the sexual side of things, that basically whatever you do, you must not ask donors about their sexual um, behavior. Now, that was probably linked to, because that will be a big turnoff to, to donors, and you may lose uh, uh, donors accordingly. But I I mean, I could be wrong. My, my interpretation was that there was a bit more to this. And the reason, and maybe I'm doing it with a degree of retrospection, because subsequently Mrs. Thatcher became terribly concerned that there was going to be, uh, and actually prohibited, a, um, uh, a survey of the sexual habits of the population that I think the Wellcome Trust or some such body was going to conduct, and she, she wasn't having it. Uh, and I suspect there was a degree of sensitivity because this was um, an area of, of, of great sensitivity involving uh, homosexual population, involving um, sexual practices, which were having to be spelled out increasingly. And I do actually, amongst some of the, the few bits of briefing that I recall giving ministers was having to be very explicit on some of the things that I was just learning. I was a page ahead of, uh, of them in learning these things. Um, so, so that I think there was this overtone um, to do with, with sexuality uh, and homosexuality and, of course, potentially drug abuse as well. So it was a terribly sensitive subject. So I've got about, I think, 15 minutes more questions for Dr. Wolford of my own. Um, it matter for you, for Dr. Wolford's convenience and the convenience of others, uh, as whether I continue now, then I can essentially get all my questions done and then we can have a decent break because I'll, I'll need to consider questions from core participants. It does mean a slightly longer well, day. Let, let, me, let me ask Dr. Wolford because you're the person who's got to answer the questions. Yes. Um, the, the, the alternatives are, are these. We can have a break now, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you could probably do with, mm -hmm. um, or uh, because the council will then come back for 15 minutes, but then we'd have another break. The reason for the break then is to give an opportunity, having considered everything that you've said thus far, mm -hmm. for those uh, core participants, representatives who have been listening, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, suggest to Miss Richards uh, further questions that she may uh, want to ask you. It's what we do for every witness, you, mm -hmm. you may have seen. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes uh, probably a, a, about half an hour, I would think, in terms of a break here, here, because you have three days of evidence to, uh, to think about. Mm -hmm. So the, the choice is stop now, come back for 15 minutes or thereabouts, break for another half hour or so and come back and finish whatever we finish. Or we go on now for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. then have the break mm -hmm. uh, and finish whenever we finish. So it's quicker if you like to go yes. on, Yes. but it's entirely a matter for you and what you feel like. That, that's, that's very kind. I'm very conscious of the fact that people have been sitting here. I at least have a semi-active role. I'm very conscious of the fact that people are sitting here and it must be, they must be dying for a break. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy to go with whatever, whatever anybody else wants to do. My personal preference, but it's not to influence anybody else, is that I would prefer to press on, frankly, than have a break and then another break and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm absolutely in, it, in anybody else's hands. And if, if there's some way of ascertaining what the audience would like, I mean, frankly, I'm, well, I'm happy to go with it. I, I tell you what I shall do. I, I'll, uh, I'll take the flack rather than uh, have it rest on you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I will decide to give anyone who, who wants to have a break now five minutes um, to have a, a, a short break. And otherwise, we will press on. Fine. So we'll take five minutes. So we'll take we? five minutes now. Five minute comfort break. Uh, <laughs> comfort break, and uh, then we press on. Okay.
Um, Dr. Wolford, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you to look now um, at a document at DHSC 00022231 underscore 059. It's dated the 19th of September 1983, and we can see um, it, it's a minute from you to Mr. Winstanley, meeting of Haemophilia Reference Centre Directors, 19th of September 83, and you refer to having invited yourself to that meeting to hear the latest on AIDS. Just two bits I wanted to ask you about. Um, paragraph two says this, the relatives of the haemophiliac who died of AIDS in Bristol have taken legal advice and are keen to sue the manufacturers, Alpha and Immuno, of the commercial factor eight concentrate which he received in 1981. They're pausing there, this is something you've been told in the meeting, mm -hmm. right? Well, mm -hmm. I think it's the obvious reading of this minute. And then you say this, if they go ahead, this could put the cat amongst the pigeons. Is it worth mentioning at this stage to ID and Sol C? Mm -hmm. I assume that's a reference to your information division and to the legal department. Yes. W w w why did you use the phrase, uh, and what did you mean by it? If they go ahead, this could put the cat among the pigeons. I meant that it was quite likely to go to, uh, uh, to impact um, back, if you like. This was a case in, in Bristol. There were likely to be significant consequences, probably uh, involving our lawyers as well. I suspect it was um, a loose phrase after having enjoyed a meeting of the Haemophilia Reference Centre directors, and I just thought, well, this is going to cause mayhem, really, if in fact there is a lawsuit and the Committee on Safety of Medicines has just said we're not doing anything about product I think that I, I don't think you can put a more, well, at least I wouldn't put a more serious construction on it than a loose way of talking. And, and then just the, the first paragraph um, uh, refers to Professor Bloom reading out a letter which he's prepared for the mm -hmm. Haemophilia Society to send its members. I an update on his earlier letters. I haven't got a copy of the letter, but it sounded reasonable and hopefully will not create any new problems. Can you assist us with understanding what you mean by saying it won't create any new problems? No, of course, because I can't remember what the letter said. Uh, I don't know. I, again, I'm merely saying I saw, I heard a letter being read out. It didn't seem to lead to any particular consequentials for us in the department. But again, it's, it's, it's putting quite a lot of weight on a, an informal note. Uh, just telling Wynne Stanley on what had, what had happened in the meeting. Um, if, if we can um, take that down now. I, I want to ask you now about a separate topic, which is about the collection of blood from prisons. Yes. Um, uh, we look at three documents, and then I um, can uh, ask you some, some general questions about it. So the first is PRSE 0004345. Um, uh, it's uh, dated the 27th of July, 1983, um, uh, and it's from uh, um, J.B. Brown, MB2. Uh, do you know what MB2 was? It's part of Medicines Division. And then if we look at the top of the page, addressed to Mr. Parker in HS1, use of blood from prisons at a recent meeting of Medicines Division's Inspection Action Group Concern was expressed about the collection and use of blood from Borstal institutions and prisons. Blood transfusion centres in Scotland were making use of these sources, particularly prisons, and some at least of the English blood transfusion centres were also understood to do so. The group considered this practice to be highly questionable because of the incidence of homosexuals and homosexual activity in prisons and the present unease about the incidence of AIDS amongst this group of people. The group asked to be advised of departmental policy on the practice of collecting and using blood from brothels and prisons, and I shall be grateful if you will let me have a note about this, um, which I can um, pass on. Um, and um, if we just go back to the whole document, can we just, can we just look at the, the full document? Um, yes, so the handwriting at the bottom of the page, Mr. Wynne Stanley, please... Um, consult. consult with Dr. Wolford um, and reply direct on my behalf. So that's the first document. Um, then if we go to PRSE 0003281. Um, 
we've got a note there, um, which is 26th of August 1983, I think. Um, I'm not sure if it's obvious who this is from. Um, but anyway, Mr. Wynne Stanley, DHSS Rang, he's received an inquiry from Medicines Inspection Re Departmental Policy on donor sessions in prisons and borstals, given there is now AIDS. He explained that England and Wales have tended to shy off, in fact... In fact, because of hepatitis. Because of hepatitis, but he wouldn't know... He, he wondered. He wondered what Scottish position was. Um, um, and then there's a reference to a, 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 an RTD meeting. Um, uh, I summarise, I summarise, summarise, summarised to Mr. Wynne Stanley what was said then and referred to the general position. He was interested in the reference to the, I can't read the next word, approaching the working party on selection and something of blood donors. And we'll try to explain that avenue. Yeah, he will. He will copy his response to MI to us. So there's, there's been some liaison on any event between, um, it would seem, the department in the form of Mr. Wynne Stanley and the Scottish Home and yes. Health Department, I think. And then um, there's a memo from Mr. Wynne Stanley copied to you. And this is really where I want to then ask you for your uh, involvement. It's at PRSC 0004729. Um, and this is dated the 23rd of August, 1983, Mr. Wynne Stanley to Mr. Brown. It says, I'm replying on behalf of Mr. Parker to your minute. It's difficult to advise any particular departmental policy on the collection of blood from borstals and prisons at the moment. It is for individual regional transfusion directors to determine how and from where donations are sought in the light of the targets they need to achieve and the numbers of donors on their panels. However, transfusion directors have been aware of the dangers of relying too heavily on prisons as a source of donations for some time i.e. prior to the advent of AIDS as a cause for con of concern because of the risk of hepatitis in prisons, also connected with the higher incidence of homosexuality, which can be spread through blood transfusion. Nevertheless, although most regions, especially those with no shortage of donors, may not need to use prisons, there is at least one which has to view them as a major source of donations in order to meet targets. AIDS has now, of course, called um, the, quest, the wisdom of continuing to view prisons as a source of blood even further into question, and the directors are due to discuss it at their next meeting in September. If the risks are now considered too great to justify continued collection from prisons, some measures will be needed to compensate for the loss of that source of donors, perhaps, for example, a system whereby regions with no need to rely on prisons can take extra blood to be transferred to those regions for whom the loss of prisons as a source of blood will cause difficulties. I shall, of course, advise you of any developments which occur I gather this problem has been debated by transfusion directors in Scotland, but no particular policy line emerged. We shall obviously need to liaise closely with Home Office also, since they have in the past been very much in favour of blood donation by prisoners. And we can see, if we look at the bottom of the page, Mr Winstanley's minute is, is copied to you. Um, now, this would appear to indicate that the, the practice of collecting blood from prisons was still ongoing in England and Wales, not in all areas. Mm -hmm but in at least one, and was still ongoing in Scotland. Um, and there appears to be a suggestion of the, d the department, the DHSS, having no particular policy in relation to that. Can you cast any further light on this issue? I had absolutely no idea that we collected blood from prisoners. Uh, of course it's a bad idea, and uh, basically it, it shouldn't have been going on. Scotland, I think, did much, much more, but I wasn't aware until this issue came up that we were actually doing that. Nor did I, I think, at the time... The, oh, the time I found out about the Home Office being quite keen for... Um, was it, No, it was the homosexuals that they were quite keen to in, encourage as well, I think. I can't remember. There was some sort of reference to the Home Office on the 3rd of June meeting... Um, the Home Office needing to be informed about something. But basically, as far as I can recall, I have I had no knowledge that, that at the time regional transfusion centres were going out to prisons and collecting bloods from prisoners because it seems like a thoroughly bad idea. Uh, the, 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 the problem, in a sense, thrown up by Mr um, Winstanley's responses is it, it doesn't appear to be envisaged that the 
department mm -hmm. is going to do anything about it. That's true. Do you think the department should have been doing something about it? My personal preference would have been for the department to say this must stop. And would you agree that um, irrespective of, um, of what was known by this time in relation to AIDS, this was a terrible idea in any event. It was, a, ter was, it was, a, ter I, it was a terrible idea. Um, there's a reference there to it being essentially down to individual regional transfusion directors. Is, is that another manifestation of the, the clinical freedom? Not the clinical freedom, the transfusion directors' freedom, because RTDs, um, as I've explained before, really uh, were, were not actually managed, but they were overseen by their regional health authority. But essentially, RTDs were fairly autonomous. So it was just another manifestation of a degree of autonomy, but not clinical autonomy as such, because that is, relates to the patient-doctor relationship. So it's potentially a, a reflection or an, a, an adverse consequence of what you described, I think, earlier and in your statement is this collection of loose fiefdoms. Yes. With there being no unifying national blood transfusion right. service as a legal entity. Yes. Um, there's reference there to it's going to be discussed at the regional transfusion directors meeting in September. And you, you address this in your statement, and I raise it just so that we can correct something. Yes. The references you gave in your statement to um, a director's meeting and to a, um, your, a, an internal minute from you are actually references to the haemophilia centre director's meeting in um, September of So I got the wrong, wrong meeting, have I? Yes. Oh, don't, right. don't worry about that at all. Uh -huh. And it's a matter I'd raised with Miss Gray. There's no, there's no criticism of you in, in, in raising it. it it's the wrong references. Um, and we haven't then troubled you with additional documents. No. But when you look, when one looks at the regional transfusion director's next meeting, because there was one, mm -hmm. I can't remember whether it was September or October, it's not discussed. Right. D do you have any idea about what happened in relation to this policy? No. If it, if it isn't written down in the me minutes of the meeting, then it, either it was discussed and only cursorily and somebody didn't minute it, or it wasn't discussed. But I, I wouldn't, I don't remember anything about it at all. And, and then do, do you know um, what the position was in relation to the collection of blood from, from the military, either in England and Wales or in Scotland? No. Can, can I then come to the role, just go back to the role of the Chief Medical Officer briefly and the issue of Chief Medical Officer letters? Um, we, 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 we can look at the, the, the examples of letters if it would be helpful to you, um, Dr. Wolford. But broadly speaking, you, you've, you've identified um, two letters uh, of, of some relevance in the sense that they're, they're dear doctor letters mm -hmm. from the chief medical officer. There's one in 1982 in relation to the hepatitis B vaccine. Yes. And then there's one which you've referred to in your evidence yes. already today in 1985 in relation to, to, to AIDS. Mm -hmm. What, 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 in what circumstances, and, and I'm really asking you to call here not just upon your own involvement in uh -huh. the department at this time, but your own later involvement as a deputy chief medical officer. Yes. In what circumstances was it the, 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 the practice of the, the, the chief medical officer to issue dear doctor letters? I think it was pretty rare. I mean, that's to say it occurred several times in any given year. Uh, and there should be a whole archive of Dear Doctor letters in, in the department. So, in, in effect, it's, it, you can, uh, as it were, check on all this. Mostly, they would, um, com they would be to do with what I would call a wider public health issue, not a specific issue related to a specific group of patients needing a specific sort of care. So, it would be to do with vaccines. Vaccines was one that he, he, the CMOs did write uh, letters about. The, the interesting thing about the letter that uh, Sir Donald Atchison wrote about AIDS, actually, the first um, Dear Doctor letter, if you like, about AIDS, which was in 1995, it, it may throw some light on, on what I'm saying now. I think just towards the end of the letter, um, there's, there's a whole lot of very useful information, and there's a there's a section from CDSC describing the latest state of epidemiology. 
But then there's a form of words just towards the very, very end of the letter, and you may or may not have it here. I might have brought it in with me, which says, and he's saying to doctors in the field, as it were, in, in the NHS, I have taken the liberty of writing to you about this because AIDS is a new disease. It's an extraordinary form of words uh, because what he's saying is, I wouldn't normally do this. But because AIDS is this new disease, and obviously he felt, rightly in my view, that there was a need for this dissemination, but he felt he had to almost beg their pardon for having intervened in this way and having written to them. And I just thought that was extremely revealing, and I thought it actually, um, it actually said all I could reasonably say about how a letter from the CMO to doctors uh, was, was as it were viewed, and it was not usually in relation to a, a, a particular disease. And, and just so that we have, you're, you're, you're almost absolutely verbatim, almost. I take the liberty of sending this information. Yes. Because AIDS is a new disease. Yes. And, and I won't put it on screen, but for anyone's reference, um, in terms of legal representatives, it's DHSC 000 2327 underscore 016. Um, I'll ask you to consider two matters in relation to uh, the sending of a dear doctor letter or equivalent by the CMO at an, at an earlier stage and why it, perhaps it, it, it should have been considered. Um, this was a, a new disease, as, mm -hmm. as the later letters from Sir Donald Aitchison says. It was a disease with a very high mortality rate, a disease about which, as you've said, there was much uncertainty, um, a, 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 that had the potential to affect very profoundly a, an identifiable cohort of patients, and I'm dealing for the purposes of this present, this first scenario with, with patients receiving factor concentrates, but, but obviously in the context of a much bigger public much health bigger. issue. Yes. Wouldn't the emergence of that be really uh, would have been a very good thing for the chief medical mm -hmm. officer to um, to share mm -hmm. such information as there was, because mm -hmm. not all doctors would have had access mm -hmm. to the same sources of information that 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 the yeah. department had. Well, I agree with you. I mean, essentially, it, we have focused here necessarily on patients with haemophilia. By the time the CMO was writing that letter in 1985, there were still only three patients with haemophilia, two of whom I knew about in my time, and there had obviously been one other. But there were really quite large numbers of homosexual men and also drug addicts and also spouses and some children by then who had developed AIDS. And this was a completely new disease. So I agree with you that in this particular instance where it's not a question of saying, well, here's a new development about a disease that you all know about or whatever. This is a brand new disease. Frankly, it's the start of a new pandemic. Not, you know, you don't actually news normally realize you're at the beginning of a pandemic until you're right in it, but that's what was happening. And I think it would have been a good thing to do to have written out sooner than, than was the case particularly as one saw the numbers of cases in, um, in non-haemophiliacs going up so that it became of a much broader general interest than, than of a, a select group who might be presumed to be being told about it by their um, clinicians. And because if, if, if we leave aside for a moment that group that I've already canvassed with you at some length the, the, and whether information should have been given yes. by the department or the CMO to haemophilia clinicians, leave those aside... You yourself have flagged up um, as a particular concern those patients who might be receiving, being treated with concentrates, treated with blood products in, in hospitals that were not haemophilia yes. centres. And indeed, the inquiry has heard some evidence of that and of people being infected in consequence. Yes, yes. And, and neither the CMO nor the department could have made any assumption about the state of knowledge of, of those, those hospitals, could That's they? so. And then there's also the... Um, if one then goes on to a wider population level, any member of the public at any time might find themselves potentially in need of a transfusion. That's right. 
and again, um, w um, the circumstances in which a transfusion might come to be given are so many and varied, and they can involve all sorts of different disciplines, mm -hmm. not simply specialist haematologists. So th those two in scenarios mm -hmm. might have been particular reasons why mm -hmm. a, some form of CMO dear doctor intervention mm -hmm. might have been very helpful. I agree. By the time you were Deputy Chief Medical Officer, which I think was 89 to 92, mm, yes. was it that the approach to, to clinical freedom um, in relation to clinicians or the hands-off approach to, to the NHS, both of which we talked mm. about on Monday, had those changed at all by, by 89 or, or the early 90s? Um, well, I, I'm possibly better placed to talk about the NHS because as well as being DCMO, I had this role as being the uh, director of healthcare on the NHS management executive, which was also slash medical director of the NHS in England. And therefore, I found myself writing out on, on some occasions, certainly, to um, doctors or to health authorities, if you will, about specific issues, operational issues. Um, those, what I would be writing would not have replaced uh, dear doctor letters on the professional line as coming from the CMO. But there was more management of the NHS by the time I'd got to be DCMO. And that is after the Griffiths report, the um, NHS management executive was set up. Duncan Nicholl was the chief executive, equivalent to Sir Simon Stevens now. And basically, we tried, we purported to do uh, a bit more hands-on management of the NHS than um, had been done previously. Now, I just lastly got a handful of, of more general questions for you. Um, you've said in your statement, you've said in your, in your oral evidence, uh, 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 understandably on a number of occasions, I was a medical officer, I was giving advice, I was not part of the administrative hierarchy, um, uh, um, which actually ultimately either took the decisions or p put the matter up for the minister to take the decisions. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that. It may be that a theme that emerges from the evidence of the ministers who are going to be giving evidence mm. tomorrow, next week, might be we weren't the experts, we were just the politicians, mm -hmm. we relied on the medical or scientific advice that was given mm -hmm. to us. So there might be an element of, on the one hand, the mm -hmm. medical mm -hmm. officer saying, mm -hmm. well, it's down to you, and the minister mm -hmm. saying, well, no, sorry, it's down to, 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 to the medical advice. What, do you have any observations to make? Well, I think it's perfectly reasonable for a, for a minister, if he or she is to be appropriately briefed, they must expect on a scientific matter, such as we have here, just as our current government uh, ministers rely on uh, Chris Whitty and other medical advisors, the DCMOs, to give their best possible advice, I think it's absolutely right that ministers are right that they have to rely on the scientific advice that they're given. And uh, of course they should challenge it if they're unhappy because they've, they're hearing things from elsewhere that doesn't seem to chime with what's being given. But I don't see how it's possible for a minister to uh, take a view on a particularly thorny scientific issue, and this was a very thorny scientific matter, uh, without seeking to get the best possible advice that he can get. Now, to the extent that that is the role of the CMO, to ensure that the advice that is coming up through the medical and scientific echelons of the Department of Health is properly supported by advice that they are getting from experts because as I've said before and it you know one really can't repeat it too much most doctors in the Department of Health were not specifically expert in their particular field they became very knowledgeable we all became fairly knowledgeable but they weren't necessarily expert their job was to go out and collect as much information and try to interpret it as well as they could to help the administrators put up their um, the submission, or to to, um, to uh, brief ministers face to face, and certainly throughout my career, I did brief ministers face to face, but almost certainly as a 
uh, a member of a team with administrative colleagues, um, and I, I, I expected to give my best possible advice, but my best possible advice I expected to be based on whatever I had been able to glean from the experts in the field. Um, a second um, general question is this. Um, who, and this is again really asking for your comment, your observation, yeah. not just from your, the period that we've been focusing mm -hmm. on, 77 through to 83, but given that you've been involved in the public sector and the NHS in a range of roles over the years. Um, who, in terms of a person, I don't mean named person, I mean their role, Secretary of State, Chief mm -hmm. Medical Officer, Clinician, what, what, what person or organisational body in, in, your, in your view had, had the overarching responsibility for ensuring safe delivery of NHS treatment in the late 70s and early 80s? That is an extraordinarily difficult question. <laughs> and Appreciate just at the end, the end of the, of the session, day, yes. a very difficult question. For safe delivery of care, well, in, in technical terms, there is no doubt but that the Secretary of State for Health, uh, or at my time for Health and, and uh, Social Security, had that ultimate responsibility. So I don't think there is, I, I don't think that should be d debatable that was where the ultimate responsibility lay. How that became then um, translated into action, uh, obviously that's where the levers, I suspect, became, um, as we once said in a different context with the, for the NHS, like rubber levers. The levers were not fit for purpose. And then finally, you, um, you have talked in your witness statement and, and, and you mentioned it again in the course of your evidence about financial constraints yes. the elephant in, in, in the room I, I, is it the case and again I'm really asking for your overall yes. perspective as someone who had a reasonably close involvement in the issues for a important period of time is it the case do you think that funding for the safety of blood and blood products was not a sufficiently high priority I can't, I can't express it in terms of priority. I think I did explain in my um, statement that funding of the NHS wasn't high enough up a government priorities. I think the, the, uh, G, the percentage of GDP was somewhere around about 3.75% being compared with now, which we know is uh, forgetting COVID is very much higher than that. So there was an enormous range of priorities for government in the, in the health sphere. And it's hard to know precisely where you should locate uh, the priorities. But with regard to the NBTS in particular, it was for regions in, that, in the organization as we then had, to determine how much money they were going to accord their um, regional transfusion service. And the interesting thing was that some regions were so much more generous to their regional transfusion centers than others. So that was almost, it was their tranche of money, how they, how they divided it up in terms of the priorities in the NHS between the regional, the blood transfusion service and all their other priorities was a matter for regional health authorities and their regional chairman. And as I say, it was very variable. It depended uh, what region you were in, how, how well funded your, your uh, regional transfusion center was. So those are the, the, the questions I had for Dr. Wolford, but obviously we, we do now need a further break a longer break so that I can consider suggestions from uh, recognised legal representatives and core participants. Well, all right. It, um, are you right? Do you think you need about 40 minutes? Um, they, um, 
Um, the, the, the nod from behind leads me to think there's probably a lot for me to look at. Um, so, yes, please. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry about that, uh, Doctor, but um, we'll, we'll take a break in that case until 5 to 5. Thank you, sir.